So yeah, again, thanks so much for like um, wanting or like being cool with being like a part of this because it's, as I said, it's just the, the first one of these. I did look up today that it's been as of like a few weeks ago. So like late September. I've been doing this for five years, these GibGab things. Oh, really? That's yeah. cool. What what yeah. kind of range have you been getting for them? Um, it varies quite a bit. And I think it's like... It self selects, I think, as well. So I don't, I don't get like as wide because I think like people will see it, and I think there's a lot of people that'd be like, "Yeah, this isn't real," or, or or something along those lines. So like those kind of people get filtered off, and then people who are like earnestly interested, they'll be like, "That's kind of cool," but I, maybe I don't want to bug them, or like maybe I'll wait till I have something, and then that sort of filters some other people off, and then some people make it past that thing. I kind of have like a, a fairly diverse knowledge set. It doesn't right. go deep in a lot of areas, but there's like a, a reasonable enough overview and a, and a, and a fairly tuned um, kind of like aesthetic judgment or like a kind of uh, overarching kind of sensibility, which is um, super useful for kind of putting things together like that. Um, right, right. I reached out to like I go or I used to go pre-COVID to this open mic every week and there'd be lots of it's Seattle here. So there's a lot of very interesting musicians and after the open mic there's some really there's some people that i know i just have to talk to i have to understand how they made their music why they make their music and for me seeing you open your gib gab that was kind of like that it was like oh this person if i saw this person in an open mic i would have to talk to this person <laughs> like, so it was it was very yeah very curiosity inducing and inspiring to read what you've done and I just, yeah, it was very interesting. And I, I don't know what you want to talk about. I have some things that we could talk about. I have a lot of questions, um, but I'm open. Hi, Rodrigo. I've never met you. You've never met me. But I came across your PhD thesis and knew that you're someone that I would love to talk to. I could tell that you are someone who thinks a lot about instrument design and the interaction between music and the user. And also the interaction between composition, performance, and how you incorporate the elements of process into the music itself. I make music under the name Infinite Digits. I also make art too, and it's something I think about a lot. How do I incorporate the process of the art into the art itself? And how do I design an interaction with the art so that I can sort of develop my thoughts as freely as possible? It looks like something that you spent a lot of time thinking about and you're very knowledgeable about, so I love the opportunity to talk to you about it. Thanks for that. And I think for me, I I like that a lot as well. And I've been super lucky that like I've had people that have been very open with me in the past, and even now, like like buddies of mine that know like a lot more in certain domains than me. That I'm like, how do I do this, or how do you do, or, or like just kind of picking people's brains. And people are very helpful and open with that. And I, I feel it's um, it's not responsibility or anything like that because that makes it like it it frames it in in a way that I don't think is very useful. But like there's um. Also being open, I think, is very important to do as like a principled position. And and I, I mean that in terms of like time, like like something like this, like sharing like actual time and helping people as well as being super open and transparent about process. And, and you know, I guess with like with Dan Dirks's podcast as well, like that's a big part of it for him, like making that process a bit more transparent. This is Sound and Process, a, an exploration of the online community lines. Uh, I know that I wouldn't be able to make the music that I want to make if it weren't for these people's uh, examples uh, and their guidance. Um, so the inspiration for this came together uh, from a post by Ray Tracer, who was looking for a section of the forum to focus on how we use the gear that's brought us all together in our music. And I responded with something about how I always wanted to ask a million questions, but worried that it would clutter the stream, to which Jason W., in his always kind way, replied that he'd love it if the stream were cluttered with this sort of stuff. So the way that made sense to me was for the producing members of our community to share their process in making uh, the works that they've put out. In your initial email, there was a lot of interesting stuff in there that I think like you know, we're going to end up talking about. But I think the for me, one of the things that I feel very satisfying or I enjoy engaging with is this sharingness and this openness and even this conversation and like the, the gesture of this of, of being open with people is inseparable from the noun of art like it, right. it's not 
It's not this like this thing that you kind of engage with that then like there's ah okay and then on the side oh yeah no no I actually make real art too like it, like they're not separate things right it's like a community of artists or musicians sort of and this yeah yeah, yeah this like dialogue I mean this is like uh, back to the open mic that's like what it was most of the people that go to open mic are people that play at the open mic and so they're yeah. all musicians already they're also listening to other people and they can give like criticism but like kindly you know or like feedback or collaboration. Uh, and I think this uh, finding people on the internet like you uh, it kind of facilitates that on a non-local level, on a global level. It's so cool. It's so cool. And you're in <laughs> Portugal. I'm in Seattle. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it's good that you're like a morning person as well, because that <laughs> okay. that lines the time up. Um, but yeah, no, I, I agree. I think there's yeah, that's an important thing. And I think the um, yeah, that, that community aspect is is kind of invaluable. I, I didn't realize it, it for whatever reason it, I didn't put together that like barcodes was your your thing as well because I had seen it and I was like oh yeah that's really cool and then I had I'd seen it in your email but I thought it was like um because you mentioned soft cut as well so I thought it was like some of your um patches isn't the right term like what what is it the scripts yeah, scripts yeah yeah yeah, yeah barcode like... that was the first one and that's like yeah I said soft cut because it's basically I took that tutorial and it was just what if I, instead of two voices or whatever, made it all the voices and then all the yeah. LFOs, all the parameters, and then it turned into that thing. Yeah, that thing, yeah. I love that little thing. That It's just, it's so much fun because I come from sort of a software, not really, software is my hobby. My job is science and it's uh, actually, there's a crossover because I use software in science and I have to write my own stuff, but all the music stuff is just a hobby. And I found that very accessible, the Norns, Lua programming, the soft cut that uh, Ezra made is very, very accessible. And I was just like, oh my God, I can do so many things. I can just think about something and then immediately just write it up so easily. Uh, and a lot of those things like barcode was building off other people's stuff, but I've started just having ideas and then popping them into code and seeing what they sound like, which is so satisfying and so interesting. <laughs> sometimes it doesn't work at all, but sometimes it's kind of cool. I mean, Brian is, is really good at, at that, at like uh, engaging or cur not curating, but like like um, gesturing towards um, where community can happen. So on lines in general, but also like, um, like the Monome stuff as hardware and the software around it the norns and the hardware and the software around it and like the the open source shield and all this like it's uh he has a good sense for for moving things in a direction that will do that and then it kind of takes a little bit of a life on its own which is what's happening with a lot of like the the norn scripts and i think will carry on happening and i think um there's been i mean there's been we've had the bella for a few years and there's been a few other platforms that are kind of like audio hats for little embedded computers but um having something that's like well, for one, the Norns itself, like the physical thing is really nice, but also having like a just a, a well thought out architecture around it and a well thought out like um, way to get code on it and off of it and share it and all of these kind of things. There, there's a lot of brains behind that to make that work really well in a way that does this, you know? Right. I, I've played with other things. I think having Lua on top of Super Collider is very nice because Super Collider is very impenetrable to me. I've played with it a little yeah. bit. I even, I like before that I played, oh, I have like the NTS1. I wrote scripts for that, but that you have to write in C and it's very hard to debug. I tried to write things from scratch just for fun, like things in Arduino also in C. And this is, this is the first thing that's like, oh, this language is so easy and it's debuggable and it's fast. And it's, it's just nice. It's great. I mean, it's built yeah. off the super collider, so I don't have to deal with all this stuff that Ezra wrote, yeah. which is great. Well, I mean, it's great that like like he put all that energy into like having a soft cut because I think there's so many there's so many patch or scripts that are just oh yeah soft cut. Oh, yeah. I think most yeah. of mine are just soft cut. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, you could do a lot with that. Like it's 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 the uh, like a nice back end like audio looping right. sampling manipulation. I mean, like th that encompasses like 80, 90 percent of what I do with a computer. Is, is something right. like that, you know? Um, so yeah, like- Yeah, I, I wasn't familiar with your stuff until I heard that podcast, like the party van. And I still haven't actually been able to try it. I'm not, uh, I've never used Max or uh, MSP. And I've only, I use a, I tried Pure Data and that's another one that I found kind of impenetrable. Yeah. Uh, but it looks, it's very, that's when I saw that as like, oh, we have very, like 
I've been thinking a lot about very speed and looping and like a tape and how you manipulate the tape. Uh, this is all, I mean, it's, I think it my when I first started in the synthesizer, it was only actually like eight months ago. Uh, and it was, uh, I had sold a, I had a side project selling websites and I sold a website and I made enough money to buy an OP1. Uh, and I liked it because of the tape, because I saw people using the tape as an instrument. And I was like, what? You can use a tape as an instrument? It's bog it blew my mind. So I was like, uh, it was the only thing I saw that was kind of like that. I used to have a task cam and I, was, I love that thing, but I never thought about using it as an instrument. I mean, it, it's super powerful what you can do with things like that. I and mean, there's a, a bunch of guys that do things with, I mean, like, like reel to reel tape or like unspooled yeah. tape around, you know, like, like you can go really far with it. There's this group, I don't remember their name, but I'll, I'll, I'll find it. But like they, it's a, a Japanese, performance group where they do things around and using physical tape and it, the music it tends to be a little cheesy for my taste but like they'll have one where it's like they have like a, a bunch of audio tape strewn around and then if you hit the tape with a, a stick it kind of moves the tape forward and backwards enough to kind of produce audio so they can kind of use it as pseudo drums and then other things like this where they have like um I think they have one where like they're sort of moving it like a bow and that kind of moves the tape around but like they have a whole bunch of like performance ideas that are or something like this where it's using tape in a physical and very instrumental manner, um, right. the music they tend to make with it tends to not be very exciting for me, but the way in which that they engage with tape is super interesting. Yeah, I think the tape, it's very fascinating, but I don't want to deal with it physically, personally. <laughs> so like, that's why I also really like the soft cut, because it's all digital. So I can just yeah. like, it's all there, it's just digital. I just think of it as a tape and what, yeah, think about how you can play tape. That is very cool. I want to look into that because I all these ideas about how people manipulate tape, I've been kind of experimenting with just to see what it does. There's this other guy that um, does this stuff, which that one I'll be able to find a little bit easier. Um, it's He has an instrument that uh, he he has it named, but he basically uses a, almost like a turntable saw where he'll have a length of tape that'll have like a sample here and a sample there and a sample there. And he'll kind of move the tape forward and back and then he'll have like a, a, a sort of a cross cutter like you would with a DJ thing. So he's basically kind of like scratching with with a yeah. tape. This guy, Jeremy Bell. So let me share screen here real quick. Hi, I'm Jeremy and today I am unveiling the fifth prototype of my tape scratching invention. This one uses a two inch wide loop of audio tape like they used to use in recording studios, which means I could theoretically fit as many as 16 separate music loops on it. But for now, I'm using part of that two inches to create visual markers with a dry erase pen. To debut my new model, I'll be performing my version of DJ Jazzy Jeff's version of Run DMC's version of Peter Piper. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, so there's that and yeah, I'll 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 try to remember the name of this Japanese group. I follow them on on YouTube, but like I follow like hundreds of things on there so it's it's always takes me a little bit to find something but that's another one where he's using a pedal to i think make the tape go forward and back but then because he has the heads in his hand those can move independently of the tape in the direction of the tape which starts getting into some interesting stuff like when you have decoupled in that sense he's not recording anything but with something like soft cut where you have decoupled play and record heads that can move independently mm -hmm. in independent direction at independent rates you start getting to kind of territory like this where there's like um almost a physical metaphor. Because I think what's, what's, what's sort of, for me, interesting or separate about um, something like an OP1 tape is the, the fact that there's a behavior and a set of like limitations around what recording and playing back digital audio can do. Because obviously mm -hmm. in like a digital domain, we can write samples and read samples arbitrarily from anywhere at any point. So like the idea of linear time as it would happen on, on a tape of some kind, doesn't um, necessarily exist. Um, mm -hmm. So I think like with something like an OP1, like like making it quite flat, like there's you record a thing in time and you can kind of loop a section of it, but like if you hit stop it here and if you hit play, it kind of right. does these things. And there, there's like, a, not physics, because it's not really physics attached to it, but there's the, the metaphor 
of physical tape that's attached to the digital paradigm of how it functions. Right. And it's, I think it was actually those sounds that I really enjoy, like the sound of a tape slowing down or like speeding up. Or if you like, um, I played with this a little bit. I made, I, I don't know if I sent you by, I like hacked this little, a lot of people have done this. You hack a Walkman so that the voltage controls the speed. And then I recorded some notes and then you could like spin it up to like certain pitches and spin it down. And it's cool because it has like so much uh, a movement across the notes because it's slow to spin up and spin down. Uh, it's yeah. very fun. Uh, yeah, it's fun to experiment with the tape to see what kind of sounds you can get. But some of the sounds, I don't know, I try to go for certain, certain things I do. I think I try to emulate things or emulate things that I think should work, but don't always work. Uh, and tape is very tricky to think about how it will sound, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's no shortage of, like, emulation stuff in terms of, like, just flat playback. So playing back audio on, on a physical bit of tape, there's, like, all kinds of saturation. The motors have a little bit of give and flow, like, volume fluctuations and magnetic stuff. Like, there's a lot of, like, stuff that people put a lot of time to get that kind of right, which is by no means, like, simple. And then, yeah, like these other things of like these kind of artifacts, which is something I, I find really interesting. I, I made, I have to like put it together into something a bit more like shareable. But a few years ago, I did a whole lot of recordings where I wanted to get the sound of a tape player, like a dictaphone, like a shitty, like, you know, like I'm recording like myself now speaking, like a four track recorder um, and a slightly better tape player. So I recorded all of them. I, I recorded the hiss and the hum from all of them. I recorded the sounds they made when you would hit stop and play. Uh, not, I mean, not so much the physical sound because they obviously go clack in the room, but like the what happens for the audio on the tape because um, they kind of do weird things. So like, uh, I don't know enough about the like mechanics of it, but usually when you press, press play on like, let's say an audio cassette player, um, it starts moving a bunch of like rubber things about and that kind of pulls the tape in a way that isn't in line necessarily with the, the spindles moving. So you get this kind of like... A little bit like right. of what like you right. get with these other things, but I found it to be uh, more unpredictable than that. Sometimes it went down, sometimes it went up, sometimes you get this like little warble thing. So I kind of uh, recorded oodles of like I basically recorded a sine wave onto a tape, and then I would hit play and I would I would uh, hit play, stop, hit play and stop, hit play and stop, and then I would look at it and listen because then you could very clearly hear what it's doing, and then I just kind of built a bunch of like variations of that, and the same thing when you would hit stop. Um, it wouldn't necessarily stop immediately. Like you would kind of like, cause, uh, me uh, mechanisms disengage and things. So like on a computer, you hit stop and like literally it stops on the sample if you want it to. Okay. Right. Yeah. So when you, uh, when I would hit stop in this sampler thing that I was building, um, it would do a bit of the mechanism stuff that would happen. So you would get some of this warbly things along with a bit of like a clicky, like, um, on the audio sound and then it would stop. And I recorded like 10 versions of this and I would like round robin them every time I did it. And I built this as basically a wrapper around the looper. So I had like my vanilla looper and then I had like, this was a tape behavior that you can apply to it. So you use those as samples to like emulate a tape player in a, like a digital yeah, tape yeah. player. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Oh, interesting. I also, so like depending on whether you wanted like a dictaphone or a four track or like different modes, you would get like uh, a different bit of cool. hiss, a different bit of compression. Um, and then these different behaviors of starting and stopping with a bunch of samples that I did and then these like little warbles and stuff like that. And for me, right. it sounds really good. I, I put a bit of energy into like emulating the like warble and volume drops and these things, but like it, it's good enough for my taste, but like people go really, really, really far with that. And I got it yeah. like kind of fine, like like there's a bit of more compression and a bit of hiss and this and that, but it, it yeah, it gets super, super um, intricate to fully emulate something like that. So I'm kind of curious, and this goes maybe to like my emails, um, what it can be, I'm not saying there isn't a motive, but I'm curious what your motive is for making something like that. Are you like interested in making a song with it? Or you're curious about exploring like just tape players itself? Like either of those are really cool things, but it's very interesting. Like not many people do that. <laughs> I mean, it was, it, it was a fun, like, like for, for maybe a month, maybe a month and a half, like all I did, like I'd just be in my, like in the studio and I'd just be recording hisses and hums and I, I did the same with the tape player and then with the CD player. So like my, my partner would go home and I'm just here with like, tick, tick, 
<laughs> like just recording these super silly sounds. Um, I think, and, and I think this kind of circles back to some of the things in your initial email, like there's um, like a quantization or like, like maybe like philosophically or conceptually what happens with taxonomy or like when you, when you break things into categories, you intrinsically separate what these things are. So for example, like a big part of like my PhD or, or like my sort of coming to terms as like a, a creative adult individual like thing was um, trying to dissolve some of these things that I had built up over the years. So growing up as like a, like a traditional musician, like, like playing like piano or whatever like this. It's, yeah, I saw your piano playing. It's amazing. It's, yeah. it's excellent. I also play piano. I started on piano as well. Oh yeah, yeah. I saw some of the videos. Like it's it's good. Like I like the little AI improv stuff. So yeah, it's something that like I studied for when I was a kid, and it, it's it's uh, these days I, I don't even own a piano, and I, I very rarely play one at all. Um, but it's what I, for at one point it's what I played the best in, in, a, in a, again air quotes traditional sense. But um, particularly growing up as like a classical pianist, performance was something that was separate from composition. And both of these things were kind of separate from what it would mean to make an instrument, which is something that was not on my radar at all. And all of these were discrete hats. And there were discrete roles and there were also discrete temporal events. So like you would, there would be an instrument that would be made, which was not in my purview at the time. And then you would become as a performer, you would become proficient with this instrument. And then at some point, someone would write a piece of music, which you then learned. And then you performed, which all of these happened at different times, generally by different people, usually in different circumstances, etc. And I think that there were like historical and functional and practical reasons for that having to have ha happened back when it did. Um, these right. days, I think they're less relevant. But so uh, for me, and it kind of comes back to what I was talking about earlier of like this conversation is that, is it like me sitting there like recording the sounds of a tape is that there might be something that comes from that. Like there might be a, a, a video, a, a performance, a piece of music that comes from it, but it's not about that. And, and if there isn't something like that that comes out, it doesn't mean it isn't music or art along the way as well. So it's like, it sounds like you're exploring uh, realms of music outside composition, like traditional composition, traditional performance. Yeah. I mean, you, I you had me at exploring. Yeah. Yeah. It, like, <laughs> so that, it's right. basically that, like, there's no, there's no thing, there's no other thing, like... It's all exploring. It's all playing. It's all like curiosity right. and just kind of you dig up into this and um, something may come of it, but it, it, it's not for the purposes of that necessarily. Like right. there's, right. you know, and I, I think, yeah. For me, I think a lot of the music I do and like a lot of the art I do is exploring inspiration. For whatever reason, I feel like sometimes I am very motivated to like paint donkeys or paint, you know, make music out of a tape player. And that inspiration, I just kind of, it makes me very curious and I have to just kind of explore and see what if I did do that? What would it look like? What would it be like? What would it feel like making it? Uh, and I like what you said, like uh, blending, like separating performance and composition. I like to blend the two. I think... Uh, I know a lot of people like traditionally don't like that. Like if you like make a painting, it should look like the person. I mean, this is like traditional painting. But when I paint, I like to show the brush stro brush strokes and see like where the paint has been and where it's going. Uh, and same with music. Like I try to make music in a way. Uh, this is like I, I really like the OP1 using the tape. Like making the music is the performance of the music. Uh, yeah. A lot of our music I make layers music on top of music, and I, I try to make it so that I can control everything at the same time, and at the same time, not have it just like play a MIDI file or like, you know, or play like an MP3 or something on the underneath. Like, I try to, it's actually very tricky, and it's maybe something we can talk about how to, in experimental music, more so like in piano, you can control everything, and you emit what you touch like that that's it but like with uh i guess more synthesizer digital music you control what you touch 
and you control how it emits when you touch it. And so there's kind of when you perform it, and for me, when I compose, because I compose by like performing, it's like, how do I design the system, my instruments, so that I can get like a lot of physicality, a lot of like dynamics out of it without just like having pre-recorded everything. I mean, there, there's there's like something to be said for like um, engaging or, or crafting a kind of behavior or interaction. And, as, and then if maybe yeah. if you're using it in real time, what your expectation of that would be. So, for example, right. if, if you if you have made an instrument that like every time you play a note, a sound happens, um, but when you play this one note or or every fifth note, or there's some kind of rule that isn't immediately obvious, that will affect your expectation as you're playing this instrument, whatever whatever it may be, if it's keyboard based or or otherwise. So um, the the like as you're coming up with ideas for what that would mean, there's some kind of intentionality that you have there like maybe you want to have it be confusing maybe you want to not fully know maybe you do maybe you want that like very tactile thing and like i've kind of had a, i mean I, i'm just going to speak around the idea of a keyboard as a metaphor just to make it kind of relatable here but like i don't know if you've had much of a play with like one of these rollies or um these sort of like uh continuous uh, are you familiar with them no Rolly? Yeah, let me uh, share screen here. So there's a few of these kinds of things. So Rolly Seaboard, I think it's called. Um, oh, yes. I think I've seen this where you can glide up the key. Yeah, and then they're also um, pressure. So like they're, they're, they're kind yeah. of gushy. So like you sort of press down into a key. And there, there's yeah. a few other things that like instruments that are kind of like this. Uh, the Hacken... Continuum, continuum, something like that. Right. Yeah. Um, so this one's similar, but like oh, the. I'm not that. Yeah. So the the difference here is that this doesn't have. Um, it's just a smooth surface. I mean, it's not smooth. It's like sort of felty, but like there's no keys. I mean, they're they're sort of these markers, but they have versions that yeah. I think don't have that. Or in a more abstract sense, there's the. Madrona Labs um, sound plane, which is uh, you can kind of see there, like copper plates. It's like wood, plate. so it's it's basically oh. it's all wood, and then there's just like these sort of small lines that kind of give you a tactile separation as you move from area to area that is cool it's very beautiful yeah they're, they're really interesting and I'll, I'll send you some links of the stuff afterwards of them all i find this one the most compelling in that it's the most um it's not uh, a piano with bells and whistles which for right. me the i mean this for me a... the the piano is kind of the ultimate expression and not not the piano itself, but the fact that you have keys that you can play with all ten fingers, and you have pedals for your feet, so you're engaging like, you know, eleven, twelve digits basically. You could use all twelve finger, ten fingers, and two feet. And I don't know, like maybe that's not the best. Like maybe you shouldn't use all your appendages. <laughs> but for me, the perfect instrument, that like the perfect instrument is an instrument you play with your mind. Like somehow you translate all your thoughts directly into exactly the sound whether it's a pitch or a texture into the instrument and there's no way to do that right now so you have to use like physical dials or knobs or buttons or keys uh yeah i'm just i've been thinking about this a little bit because i i, I have the cork monotron it's one of my favorite instruments now it's so like this little cheap little thing it just sounds so cool but i love the dials they're so small and I can get them to be so expressive for some reason, uh, but it's not. It's not like uh, it's not very thorough. Like I only have a few knobs, so then I'm trying to figure out like how can I add more like physical expressions, like control pads or whatever. Um, but then I'm like, okay, but then how many control pads do I want to add? Maybe I don't want to add that many. So there's like a kind of a balance in thinking about how to design this like this interaction between your instruments yeah i mean it, it starts getting really complex as well so like i kind of wonder as a thought experiment like if you had like the 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 cork thing but let's say it had like 10 knobs i mean obviously you can't right. really control 10 knobs but would you have found it to be as engaging as you have up to this point maybe I part mean, yeah i mean personally i don't think so i have a um the sh01a and it's got a lot of knobs and i love playing with old knobs but it's got almost too many that i have to like 
it's too hard to move between them because you have to be very accurate. These are so small. <laughs> Whereas if you just have like a few, your hands are on them, it's no problem. Uh, that's why I, I really liked your joystick. I started thinking about using the, the game controller because that is, it's like they designed it to be held and to be ac accessible. Um, but then as like, maybe that is also too many buttons. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Like it's, it's very personal. Uh, but I like that idea of designing like the ultimate design for an instrument interaction as we as I as you or me design these instruments. Yeah. I mean, there's there's a whole like uh, like area of research in, in musical instrument design that is around the idea of mapping. And I don't know how much of like in, in your sort of scientific studies you deal with like dimensionality reductions and autoencoders and these kind oh, of yeah. like oh, yeah like like it, where you easily get into that so like if you imagine in in well if we take like soft cut like not even as a metaphor like um most of your scripts are, are wrappers around so, uh, soft cut and there's so many patches the scripts that are this if you just had a script that was every parameter of soft cut exposed on the screen and you can like menu through them and like adjust it like that wouldn't really be exactly interesting or useful Right. So there's like there's there's an upper limit for one in terms of like physical engagement, like me as a human, I only have so much capacity to control things. And right. for, for me as a performer, I've, I've made very deliberate choices around that. So like like if I'm using sticks or if I'm playing like a, an acoustic instrument, um, I don't want a bunch of things to control or turn. So I rely on audio analysis to do a lot of that kind of heavy lifting for me. But even even if we had like some kind of like you're wearing two of these like motion sensor glove things that each finger has its own thing. On top of that, you're let's say at a piano and each key also has X, Y and Z coordinates. Um, and on top of that, you have like a like a, a Moog Taurus kind of pedal with like all of these things. You have four expression like like if we can like basically hook you up like you're in the Matrix and you're fully kitted with all this stuff. There's only so much. Well, for one, like even like at a bandwidth level. I'm not sure how much of that we can engage with in a meaningful way. So even like at a piano, like, it, I mean, even like like you might have like some Bach thing where you have like four independent voices and that's like crazy. And that's, that's like 40% of what we have here. And even then they kind of come and go. So like the, even though we do have 10 fingers, there are largely two things happening. And even then, yeah. it, it, hardly that, they just happen to have a bunch of appendages. But like, that's where some some like a lot of like many to many mappings or autoencoders and things like this become interesting because you can have in, in this sort of state um, as I do this such and such happens and if I do this such and such happens and allows you perhaps like if expressivity is is kind of a, a main focus it lets you kind of explore a performance like a parameter space that isn't a, a series of one to one connections which right, I think right. I'm I'm. Like if we take like a, a like a theremin as a kind of a metaphor, like as you get closer to this, the pitch goes up, and as you get closer here, the volume goes down. And this is cool and all, but like, I mean, I'm not a dancer, so like, I mean, there's only so much physical resolution I have with this, and how right. much I can do with this. Um, at the same time, I'm also dubious of something of like where if you use a fully, like like a many to many or some kind of autoencoder thing or, or any of these. Um, you know, like a machine learning context where like if, I, if my hands are here, it's this sound. And if my hands are here, it's this sound. And then I have like, then you sort of interpolate between these. I'm also dubious of that as a paradigm as well because for similar reasons. But it's, it's, it's a whole um, thing to explore is, is this, what you expose as a parameter, what you engage with as a parameter and how you engage with it. And I think like in seeing some of your scripts, that, that's a big decision that you make. Like in the O O O, I mean, I don't know how you would pronounce it, but like the yeah, like, ooh. I call it ooh. like the, there's deliberate limitations there as to what happens, and the interface is a big part of that, and even just the 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 sort of concept of it is, it it has a limitation, and that's what gives it that flavor. It is it right. has this identity because it's not everything, it's this. Right, I think you're right. Like I never thought about it, but. Is there's basically only two things that I'm trying to control and I think maybe that comes from piano where I usually have like bass and treble like two hands whereas if I was a drummer maybe I would be able to think in like oh I have all these elements that I can toggle with my hands so I think when I design things I tend to go for two start with two and it's very interesting what you said to think about mapping like the correlation of those two things to like two to many things uh, I haven't really I haven't really explored that. It's 
it's it's maybe hard to think about initially, but I think it's something that could be learned. Yeah, I mean, you could do a lot with without getting into any kind of like machine learning stuff. You can do like one to many in a like a handcrafted way, which I've done a lot of. Like for all my like gamepad stuff, like as I move X and Y coordinates, like the the, the X direction is mapped to a bunch of parameters, but like in a hand-tuned way. Like I control pitch right. from here to here with this function. Um, the, it's controlling the treble from here to here with a little bit of, like it, it's each one is kind of like hand dialed to do that, which is totally doable. Or when you're dealing with like a low amount of dimensions, that's super doable. You can hand tune everything. It gets problematic once you go above a few dimensions because to do that for every dimension or for every knob starts getting crazy. Right. And, right. Then, right. and then if you start doing many to many, then the complexity as I'm sure you know, goes through the roof because then the relationship okay. between you know becomes a whole parameter in of itself. But I think the it is like I do spend a and me personally. I spend a lot of time when I'm doing software stuff in that stuff in that area of like okay, and also specifically because of in my own setup, like I'll have an acoustic instrument and like one controller, so I don't have a lot of surface area of control. So I try to make the most out of that. Yeah, yeah, I liked it. I really liked your Kaizo snare. That's really, really cool. I'm curious. You also got me thinking about this. Uh, like, piano has a foot pedal, so I'm very used to using a foot pedal. And you are a drummer and a pianist, so you obviously are as well. Do you have, have you experimented with making a foot pedal controller? Do you find? I mean, I have. Or? Yeah, I mean, I nothing like beyond what what um is normally usable. So I have like an, a little expression pedal. And I have yeah. like this sort of like MIDI button controller thing, but nothing, yeah. um, nothing beyond. I was thinking about for a while having modifying my one of my expression pedals to have some extra buttons on the side to do a, like a capacitive sensor on the footbed as well, so I could tell. So normally with like an expression pedal, oh, my little camera's like um, as you move, you have that value, but whether your foot's on it or not doesn't matter. Um, so to be able to move the the footbed. But then independently, like I have it here, but now like my foot, my foot's on it. So right. now that's another parameter. So like, right. so I want to do something with that, but um, I don't know how much, uh, even, even like now, like I've set up like my small setup here. I have like a, on my left, I have like a, a, a foot switch. Actually, I'll just grab this. Yeah, I mean, you're giving me a lot of ideas, Rodrigo. <laughs> um, so this is kind of like my sort of setup that I'm, I'm working on at the moment. So I've got like a bass drum trigger thing here. I've got like an expression yeah. pedal. And then here is this thing that I've built. So it's just four um, kind of pedal type buttons um, with RGB LEDs. So it's just an Arduino TNC thing that I built. And then this little black part is just a, a 3D printed thing to make it um, a bit more stable. But so like the idea being that I have both of my feet down here, then my hands up here with like the sort of controllers that I would have otherwise. And it's, 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 it's a lot, like it feels like a lot. Like, so for example, even here, like I only have four buttons, but if I'm gonna press yeah. one of them, I feel like I have to look down, which is fine. I, I don't have a problem with that, but. Oh. So, so there you've, you've maximized though. You have two feet and two hands basically that you're using there. Yeah, and it, 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 it works good, but it, it does feel like a lot. And as I said, like right. maybe if I only had two buttons here, I would kind of, um, I wouldn't have to look or think about it. So like basically when I'm up here playing and all of this and I want to press one of the pedals, I kind of have to, like I do that, like in a first person sense, like I'll kind of look and make sure I hit the right one. Um, so, I mean, I can maybe just have one single pedal and then just kind of do a lot of mappings around the idea of one pedal. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, I've thought about it. I, like, I don't think I would want anything as complex. I mean, I do have like a, the Keith McMillan soft step. I don't know if you've come across that. It's, um... Let me show you here. You're giving me this idea now of like, I, mean, I also play saxophone and because I've been interested in tape and manipulating saxophone noises, that's some, one of my scripts is I've tried to do that a little bit, but it, I think it'd be really cool to modulate like a tape while playing saxophone with my feet. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of range to go here. So I have one of these, which is like, uh -huh. um, it's a, just a USB mappable thing. They also have one that's, um, what's it called? Key step? Key? Uh... Oh, I have um, a nano control, like a mappable thing. It's like sliders yeah. and stuff. Not for feet. Oh, I see. That's nice. Yeah. 
So they have one like this that's kind of, and you can see it's sort of, I don't know if you can see it, like this elevated a little bit. So yeah. it's, it's a little yeah. bit like a keyboard. So it's, it's the same kind of idea. I think it's the same total amount of buttons. It's up. This one is like keyboard layout, and the one I have is um, sort of 10 uh, grid layout. I have yeah. like the slightly older one that's more like this. Um, yeah, those are cool. Yeah, they're super handy. Like I, I, I like when I'm when I need like heavy lifting, like I, I've I've done for like not for um, Kaizo snare, but for some performances before that, that was my main foot controller. So I'd have on the floor next to me, I'd have that, and I would I would kind of navigate that. And then I, I do have to kind of look down to do it, but like it wasn't. Um, in that sense, I kind of had set behavior. So like, uh, like I'm gonna be in behavior four or number seven. So like I would already be thinking, okay, I want four and I would kind of go and do four. Um, whereas with this setup, it's a little bit more open-ended at the moment. So I just, each button is like, like an effect or a type of effect. Um, and I, I just wanna be able to kind of engage it or disengage it. Right. Now maybe I can ask, I mean, this is kind of back to the email again. Like where, where do you get your ideas? Like, what do, you, what do you think about when they come about? Are you exploring something musical or just exploring for exploring, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, in, in, in a general sense, like, it's always exploring for exploring sake, right? Like, in that, like, the, that, that's the, it's just a curiosity. It's just playing. It's just going around. But, like, um, I'll, I'll, I'll speak concretely more about, like, the, the Kaizo snare thing. So I'm, I'm working that this project, Flucoma, where it's, like, a machine learning signal decomposition tools. So for that, I knew I had to do come up with a performance. Right. And I, so with that, I was just playing with the software tools and just doing random things and um, just exploring these algorithms and all that. And it was all fine, but nothing was really jumping out at me. Independent of that, I had a, like a 3D printer I had gotten within the last few years. And I was just learning how to play with things and, and just diddling around there. And I had this sort of crossfader thing. It was like like completely unrelated things. And then one day I, had the, I got the crossfader working with it. I was like, what happens if I put like a wave folder on like a sample that I triggered with my snare? It was just like random stuff like this. And I was just like, I was like, okay, this is kind of like, this is a thing. And, and then it just kind of, it with a lot of my um, performances, they tend to be um, very limited parameters and like very laser focused. So like it became about like these sort of crossfader turntable snare sounds with like bell right, samples. Right. So it was like a what if, like what if I combine these two things together? Because I also yeah, saw that yeah. you you mentioned that uh, I think in that that you were inspired early in your childhood about turntablism that you yeah, have an experience. Yeah. That's always been in like the background, but I never never fully actioned something with it. I mean, I did, and I, I talk about it a little bit in the blog post where like I did kind of get into a little bit, but then we moved house and a lot of things happened, and that sort of went back back burner stuff. Um, but it, it it was kind of always there, and in a similar thing of like with your interest with with tape, like the. I like the idea that the manipulation of time and the manipulation of memory and, and sampling right. and all this was like tied to a physical moving. It's not a metaphor in here. Like it's literally the, the mechanism with which audio plays, but there's like these restrictions to how that behaves and our expectation of it. And I find right. that really interesting and I still right. do. Right. Um, so there, there was a lot of that kind of like latent stuff there these latent ideas of it and yeah like it just kind of all started congealing together but like through me yeah. just kind of like wispily kind of exploring about um right. and and even to the point like now i'm i'm confident enough with my facility for that but I, i'm a strong believer that like creativity is like this kind of like little tiny like flickering muscle that it just kind of does like it doesn't do much it just does this little kind of thing and it's very susceptible to being overwhelmed. So, like, if you have, like, this kind of little spark, and like, oh, wait, what do I... And then you're like, oh, hold on, but if you kind of do this... And then before you know it, you've, you've boxed it out. But if you're right. like, oh, wait, right. so what happens if I do, like, tape, wrap tape around my head while underwater... Like, I don't know, it, it could be just some ridiculous idea, and you just kind of follow it. It may be nothing, it may, but it may be something. But, like, the, the, the creative thing, it's just this little, like, kind of, like, little tiny thing that you then kind of amplify. Right, right. Yeah, a lot of mine come from, uh, I think, musical or like art. Like I see something or hear something. I like, I want to design around that. I want to explore that sound. Like the last album I did was just the Cork Monotron because I heard it and I was like, oh my God, it sounds so cool. I just kept making things. I was like, what if I layer this and this and then do it this chord or this chord or this chord? So I think mine follows a very, uh, I don't know, like a performance or 
I like to have something that I can listen back to or look back to on it. But otherwise, I do a lot of projects that if I find they don't sound good, I actually stop them. And kind of like, it's it's like, okay, I could try to make this good, but I don't know. Like the, the tape player um, that it manipulated with voltage, I found that it actually didn't sound super good. I think it's because my tape player sucked. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'll just explore something else for now. It's not quite where I want it to be. Uh, but it, I, that's kind of, yeah, I guess my filter for that is maybe too high. I don't know. I, I really like things to sound a certain way. And so when I, they don't, I kind of just drop them. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, I have no shortage of, of abandoned project and abandoned <laughs> things laying about, which, which, which end up doing that. But like, I, I tend to kind of feel okay in, in, in going that direction. It's a little problematic because there's there, like, I also have ideas, musical ideas, that I, I have an idea like, in my mind where I want the piano to sound just like this. But I have no idea how to do that. And I think sometimes I learn how to do that through building things and trying things that these things actually that I end up drop. Sometimes they end up being seeds for other things that I do. Uh, but it's almost it's sort of random. And that's the part I don't like about it. And that's why I like asking this question to you and other inspiring people, because I don't like the randomness of inspiration. I wish there was. Like the what if question is a great question to always ask. What if I do this? What if I do that? That's kind of a usually a pretty constant source of you have to sometimes ask it a lot, but some usually it's a consistent source of some inspirational thing. But I was looking to see whether the other things that can like for me, it's like hearing something beautiful or seeing something beautiful or amazing. That's very inspiring. But you don't always see or hear those things. You don't always like think of the right questions to ask. I don't know. I just like exploring inspiration i think if if someone knew a way to always be inspired that would be like you'd be like michelangelo or like leonardo <laughs> da vinci like. but you seem you I seem mean, to like, always be inspired that's why i was curious to talk to you i mean I, I i i mean i do that's not fully true i mean i was gonna say like i only put up things that i do i don't put up things i don't do but i i do like in in things when i put things up like in this most recent blog post with the kaiser snare there's a whole section of like all the abandoned things that I didn't do. Right. Right. I saw you had a whole list of actually really interesting yeah. ideas. For, for this particular yeah. project, I wanted to go really verbose and I wanted to really unpack everything. And I think that's something that people don't generally talk about. Even people who are open with process, they're, they're less open with their demons or like their sort of cobwebs. Right. So like, I wanted to be like, yeah, like I tried this and it, for various reasons, I didn't do it. Some of them were like, I did want to do it, but for technical reasons, I was unable, unable to at the time. Um, right. 
But yeah, I mean, one of the things that like really struck me with with your initial email is that you basically like had this question of like how how does one retain um, inspiration or how can one function at like a sort of I guess a high level of creativity. It was something along these lines. And then you had a, a kind of a taxonomy. You had like, there's these approaches in which one does that. What, right. you know, what, what are you doing kind of thing? And I think, I mean, one of the first things that struck me is that one of them was the, like the, the Rivers Cuomo, like Cuomo, the, the sort of Weezer oh, approach. Yeah. Yeah, always be working, yeah. Yeah, which is kind of interesting because I think you had it categorized under like capturing everything, which for sure he's doing as part of his process. But I think for me, what, Wait, just to just to be clear, I don't know, maybe for the video later. So uh, I can describe that a little bit like Rivers Cuomo is this, you know, the guy in Weezer. And basically he has an Excel spreadsheet where he writes down every single lyric that he thinks about, every chord pattern he thinks about. And he just has a list that you can go in later and then mix and match them, which I think is such a cool idea because yeah, it, yeah. it's always there. But I, I think what's, what's interesting to me about that, like his particular process, is not necessarily that he's capturing everything because he is and he's, he's making note of this and like the syllable emphasis and how many syllables per line and all that. But the, the interesting thing is there is that he's kind of transformed, like his creative process, I guess because of his disposition and personality, involves data manipulation in like a kind of a very weird and obtuse way like like because if, if i remember right he would just rec like he'd hear a cool riff he would record it as a like a random file on his computer and store it away so he wouldn't know the source anymore and then at a given point he just had all these like kind of progressions that were decontextualized and the same thing with the lyrics like there's these just decontextualized lines that he then doesn't put together in an arbitrary way, but he'll be like, okay, I need da, 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 da. I right, need 15 right. syllables and it needs to be weak, strong, weak, strong, plugs into the spreadsheet right. and brings that up. So his creative process is this filtering through a very weird mechanism. So it isn't right. so much because there, there's people who do like, um, they're always recording voice memos of melodies and this kind of stuff, which for me is a little closer to what I would think of as like an always capturing and always kind of taking yeah. things in. But for for me, what I find interesting with him is that once he has it, because most people then like just go through their voice memos and be like, oh yeah, this one sounds pretty cool. And then just use that as like a, the germ of a song or whatever. Whereas for him, it's like, no, it's a, it's in a spreadsheet. It's tabulated. It's um, He's got like these, these semi-random processes involved. And it's just right. like a... a a kind of algorithm essentially that he's crafted it is but it's actually it's not quite a solution i think as you're bringing up it's like a it's like a it still brings a problem you filtered all this information but then you still have to be it put it together in an inspired way so you still have to have some sort of like creativity to put it together like not ever it's not like a gold that's not like a bag of gold that you can dig out <laughs> It kind of is. It's it's helpful to help. Like at each start. step, so like like in recording the riffs he wants, he sort of makes an aesthetic judgment. I like these riffs, and in terms of the lyrics that end up in the spreadsheet, like I like these lyrics. Um, mm -hmm. But from what I understood, like if he needs like fifteen syllables of you know with weak strong weak strong, he plugs that in, and he gets what he gets. You know, and right. then you end up with like these kind of lyrics that are semi nonsensical. And at that point, it, it's, it's, I mean, and maybe he, he does get a couple options that he'll make aesthetic judgments based on that. But I think the, whether he's making a decision about picking this particular one or whether he's making a decision about not making a decision about which, which he's going to pick, as in like using these pseudo random right. algorithmic processes, um, the, the way his brain works is such is that he's processing the world around him into art, which is what most, you know, if we think of creative people in the, like a traditional sense and they like they, they, the world around them and it's coming out through their music or whatever, he's doing that. But through like a, his peculiar sensibility, which happens to be very systematic, very ordered, very like procedural, very kind of um, I'm not going to say data driven because you're a scientist and that means a different scale of information. But right. <laughs> but in terms of. I'm sure his uh, spreadsheet of lyrics is much bigger than mine. <laughs> right. It's a, it's a, I actually like thinking about music in this way where you design sort of an algorithm for creating music. I mean, it's like generative music almost uh, yeah. in a very abstract sense. And this is, I mean, a lot of the things I try to create are sort of along those lines, like um, because I try to make the performance, the music or like the composition, the music. I want the composition to be like generating itself. Um, like sometimes I will use 
um, pattern generators. Like I write, I, I like, I know I want these chords. So then I have a pattern generator that generates like the notes that can layer together in a way that will create the chords if you layer one note at a time. Um, and so it's not, I'm playing chords, but I'm playing it. It's like emitting in a certain way. So it's, and it, then the music to me is kind of twofold. It's like the music that comes out of it, but also the idea of creating the, the pattern generator is part of the music almost. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it may have, so like in, in like um, stochastic or, or random or like people like Cage or Zanakis, I don't know how familiar with some of their work, but like yeah. a big part of, of some of this idea is that you might have um, a piece or performance that, that is bigger than any individual manifestation of it. So there's some Zanakis piece that has more notes than you can physically play at any given point. And as a performer, you have to make decisions about what that means. But the piece itself, in like a platonic sense, um, exists above any specific performance of it. Right, right. Yeah. That's like the, <laughs> the, the thesis of that is like that. Um, who, who is that person? Uh, let me see if I can find their name. I wrote it down. Uh, is one of the a quintessential experimental music where it is you're supposed to walk into the vagina of a whale. It's like right. you're never going to perform that. No one's ever going to perform that. But it exists as like a piece of music as a process. Yeah. Uh, Although that being said, uh, I think what's his name, John McAfee. I don't. Know, he's you know he did the antivirus stuff, but he's he's like some crazy libertarian now that like is very active on social media. But he had a whole bunch of tweets. A couple years within the last few years very adamantly saying that he hasn't had sex with a whale and that like uh, he doesn't know where this is so like perhaps he's uh you know <laughs> it was uh it's nam june pike he's an experimental oh, yeah. musician yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's funny but it, so here in the sense of like like having the pattern generator um that may produce any any real about realizable amount of um progressions or patterns from this um exists a, like a level above any specific realization of that and it's interesting right. to kind of engage with at that level of creativity so like it, you, you know you're making decisions as when you're coming up with these kind of pattern generators about what it is um which is not a separate thing which is kind of like circles a little bit back for me like that that bit of code or that kind of algor algorithmic thinking or that kind of conceptual thinking is itself important and it may then produce progressions you like or don't like or you may you may choose to personally apply like an aesthetic filter to it um right. but at the same time you may choose to apply no filter to it or you may choose to apply like a technical or another algorithmic filter like you may have a, a pattern generator and then you have another you come up with another like some kind of fitness function that will like these progressions will pass or these patterns will go through it right. and, and not like you may make that decision to to have that happen are you right. familiar right. with uh christian book no, he's a Christian. book. So it's spelled B O K, but the O has an umlaut. No, I'm not. So he's a Canadian. Um, <laughs> he's not this guy. <laughs> he's this guy. Um, I guess there's also some buff fitness guy called Christian Book. Um, so he's a really interesting author. I, I think you might find some of his stuff like generally interesting. He he's he's. It's hard to explain. I'll just open his Wikipedia <laughs> rather than trying to explain it. But um, yeah, he's an experimental Canadian poet. He's done. He's really famous for this one book, Eunoia, which is every chapter is written using only a single vowel. Um, so the, the E chapter has only words with E. The U chapter has only words with U. And he does this crazy stuff like, well, he'll take like a Shakespeare sonnet and then uh -huh. redo it as an anagram where you scramble the letters and rewrite it. But keeping the word and syllable structure intact and like these kind of like crazy oh, interesting. Things. Interesting. but specifically he has this project that he um did a few years ago called the xenotext project where they bake into the um you you would understand this much better than me oh i see yeah 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 he yeah. made a he put it into a gene yes so he has then, it in a gene so that the gene, when it splices, it will splice the poetry. Yeah, but but coming up with it in a manner where any permutation or any possible slice of that would still produce valid language. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, he's really into this kind of stuff, but that might, might resonate specifically with the kind of stuff oh, that you that, do. That definitely, actually, I've done something like that. I made a poetry <laughs> generator in, uh, in college. I was curious. I was very into poetry. 
And I thought maybe like if you just took specific like evocative words and juxtaposed them correctly, uh, and I wrote this little program that did that, and it generated all these these poems, and it I put them on forums for poetry, and people <laughs> love them. And I was like, what what does this mean for poetry? But it, to me, it means um, the poems. It's interesting. I, I mean, so this specific example, I think the poems were like uh, the poems that I generated were poetry. But they're kind of like um, hacky poetry, which I guess some people like totally fine. I mean, I say hacky because it's just like they don't rhyme and they just use kind of random words and you get what you get out of it. Um, but the experiment for me, the interesting part was designing the programming for the poetry, choosing which words. So I chose very specific words that have positive connotations, negative connotations, and how you juxtapose them was the important part. So the poetry to me was like this I algorithm thought, yeah. I had that made the poems. So this is a buddy of mine, uh, David Pockney. So he got really into um, this poet, Brian Jizen. I, I don't know how you, his last name was. Pre um, but he basically did, did a lot of like early um, permutation-based algorithmic poetry and, and text generation. So he, uh, he did a bunch of research into finding all that stuff. And then... Um, it was, I guess, from what he was describing to me, it was a little difficult to go through, but because this is uh, kind of 50s, 60s, 70s, um, a lot of the algorithms that are used, I mean, he didn't make very good notes about some of this stuff, but um, this might be interesting to you in terms of like early permutation algorithms, how it was applied to poetry, and then how that kind of right. stuff was handled. Right, there's a lot of stuff that, uh, it's actually kind of interesting how it mixes with music, like cut-ups were very, the very first like experimental poetry, and it has a lot to... It's very similar to like sample music to I me, mean, especially like playing with different tape uh, samples and like spinning the tape back and forth. It's like cutting up music, putting it together in different weird ways. And there's something like from like the cut ups type stuff or, or, or early sampling or turntable stuff. There's also like a, another layer of like plagiarism and self use and, and like like cultural sampling that, that has like a different connotation than say something like generative poetry, which is also reordered. But the the authorship isn't part of the aesthetic jumble necessarily. Right. I mean, you could also right. have a hybrid, like where you cut up stuff and then shiv it in an algorithm. But I think for me, right. like part of what I found really interesting of like turntable stuff was the fact that like it was existing material, unless someone has like a, a way to you know cut your own records, which is much easier now. Um, you were right. reusing someone else's music, and that that cultural repurposing was for me part of what I found really interesting about it. And I think for like some of these early guys like Burroughs and stuff like this, that I don't think they thought of it in like like the sense of plagiarism, but like the reuse of culture and the folding of culture that way was part of it. Like it wasn't, it's not this separate, this separate thing. Yeah, yeah, I recognize that. I think for me personally, this all of this is a process that I'm trying to like get to something, whatever it is, maybe like. Uh, like with like Rivers Cuomo, like that's his process. My generative poetry is a process. I want to like make poetry to read it. And I was like, oh, just write a program to do it. It'd be so interesting <laughs> just to read this thing. Or like when I write these little soft cut things, like that is, uh, or I'm trying to generate the music that I want to hear. So I like, it's it's part of the process, but like to get to the, the point of figuring out what I want to generate and how you want to interact with it. That's the part where I need this creativity element that's very hard to find sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Right. And I think part of, like, I guess what, like, a lot of what we're kind of circling around there is that the, where that comes from and how you find it and what form it may take is, um, in like, in my experience, not very quantifiable, as in, like, there's no answer to it. And, like... Okay. Like, 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 I don't know if Rivers was sitting around. I, I don't know, actually, but maybe I, I doubt he was sitting around one day was like spreadsheets. I fucking love spreadsheets. And then just like, 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 I think it's just so it just kind of happens or, or what I, I again, I don't know how he would have ended up at this process, but it took a form that was perhaps I unfamiliar to him, but like it, it, it kind of made sense to him in a way or like Burroughs doing this stuff or, or any of these things, like the the way in which you're creative in the world and the manner in which you are creative, the only way to kind of find that path is to kind of do it, you know, in like, right. in like a sort of... And I think seeing other people's process is really, really inspiring because you see someone's process, you're like, oh, I didn't realize I could do this and that with that. Or like if you just, you can stop someone's process in the middle and say, what if I took it from there and took it over here? 
that's uh, I do find a lot of inspiration. That's how, why I like to include some process in what I do, so people can say, "Oh, I like that part of it. Maybe I can use that part of it for something I do." I don't know if that ever happens. But <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, I mean, your 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 scripts are very well liked on uh, lines and stuff. So I think, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know. There, there's something yeah. to be said for that. Some of them I actually think are failed experiments for me, but I'm glad that some people <laughs> like them. I like barcodes a lot, but the one, like the one that um, I was really interested in, is having uh, it's I called P Whip, where you play. I was going to play saxophone and then have it play back my saxophone at different pitches using the tape. So basically, the same idea as the cassette player with voltage, but I was using soft cut rates to pitch it up and pitch it down and detect the pitch that I was playing, so you could pitch it exactly to the pitch you want but it was kind of yeah. it still doesn't really work because there's problems when you change pitch that the pitch analyzer has problems figuring out and so it kind of skips and there may be ways around that but it, i was kind of disappointed in how it sounded. i mean it's some there's there's like low low hanging fruit versions of fixing that and then there's more complex right. so like in some of the stuff in this project that i'm working with Fukoma. Um, some pitch detection algorithms, I think the one in SuperGlider doesn't, but you get a pitch, but you also get a confidence metric. So the confidence, yeah. it doesn't have a confidence. Yeah, yeah, then you can yeah. filter one by the other. So if yeah. the confidence is above 0.9 or whatever, then take it as a pitch. And if it's below that, literally ignore the value so that you right. can see it. Um, but then also like doing some kind of like smoothing or a median filter or some kind of um, thing like this, because with a lot of pitch detection, or imagine if you have a breath or any kind of these things, you might get a lot of pitches jumping around or right. with some instruments, you may get false octaves, you know, okay. and these kind of things. Okay. Right. Um, right. Yeah, but just like literally slewing the 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 output you get from the algorithm, um, right. you might right. get like a little bit of latency as you jump around, but it tends to throw away a lot of the errands or like a median filter of some kind tends to get rid of a bunch of this stuff. My my idea you know, now so. actually. <laughs> I mean, after just talking to you now, it's made me realize like if I used a foot pedal and I recorded myself on tape playing saxophone and recorded the pitch at every note, I could have it slide like another voice slide back the tape to the note that the note that I actually played instead of pitching it up and down. So they don't have the, the rate problem. Uh, and then I could it's almost like a like a DJ crossfade with multiple except I'm playing one and then I have multiple records recording my saxophone. This is something I might try later. <laughs> yeah, that's really, really cool. I, I, I did a much simpler version of this, which I found really useful. I watched this talk by this guy, La uh, Lawrence Casterly, which is this old British dude who does a lot of like early sampler as instrument stuff. And uh, he did this performance at um, the university I was at. And he did a talk that I found really interesting where I'll, I'll pull him up here just to have him as a reference. So he has this kind of instrument that, you know, like sort of this or this, where he has a bunch of iPads or controllers all at once. And he plays in a manner where he, his instrument is just sampling. He's not producing okay. any sounds at all. So um, he has like, you can kind of see here, like two sort of um, MPC type pads. And then um, I think he's got some iPads. He's got a big Wacom here, a couple computers. He had this like automatic loudness detection. So whenever there was like a loud event that would put a tap in his delay line. And there was a loud event and that would put a tap in his delayed line. So for him, he would then just, he could jump back in time essentially and play at these loud points. And that sort of was the sampling. So he wouldn't have to add any, he didn't have to have the downtime of like, I'm recording now and I'm playing now. Right. It was just, the, right. the recording was just always happening, but he could just go back to these points. So you could have a similar thing where you have, you're playing sax and then at every, any given point, the pitches are tagged and you can have like a, a loudness flag. So like at these points in the past, these notes happened. And then when right. you play it again or whatever it is you want to do that, you can jump to that point in the past. So I've, right. I've done the loudness thing, which I found to be super, super useful. Like I could go yeah. back in time and I did it like I could jump back in the last five seconds or the last 15 seconds, or the last 30 seconds or a minute, like it would exponentially get bigger. Right. Um, this is exactly what I'm thinking. I have no idea what this will sound like, but I'm thinking like I have a tape that I'm constantly recording and then marking where each pitches are. And then I could almost have, I mean, maybe not do this, but like a, a physical keyboard I could play with my feet or something, or I could just like program something that picks out, and when I play a note, it picks out where position where that note was and plays it off. Uh, so it's like, 
it's playing my saxophone in the correct key and the correct tuning because it's my saxophone, but I don't have to deal with like the, the rate or like tuning the rate or whatever. And I actually have a real sample of it. it, but it will be like the notes may be very weird lengths. So I'd have to think about what that would sound like. Maybe it would sound, I want it to sound a little strange, but I, I kind of have an idea of it, but I'm not, the, the script I wrote before didn't quite uh, execute it. Yeah, I mean, there's stuff, I mean, it... Because I, th I I don't know what the onset detection stuff is like in in Norns. I'm sure there's plenty of stuff for super lighter. Basically, like if you could de like define that the, here's where a note started and then here's where the next note started, and then you know yeah. it like the note in between was probably that length, and then you can right. use that to like start playing the sample back and then stop it at that point as well. Um, and yeah. you'll have an imperfect set of sounds that have happened because unless you're going to sit there and every time you play sax, play every note at every duration and every dynamic. Um, you will have right. like an incomplete thing, but that's part of part of what will make the sound of that performance. You right. can even do a thing like with, I mean, I'm thinking something like the soft set controller where, where it's like pedals, but you also have LEDs. So you can have like, um, as you've populated pitches, those pitches light up. So like if you've played an E and F, like all of a sudden the right. E and the F on the keyboard are now blue. Right. And then like right. you could, you know that they're there. Um, and if you haven't right. played any G's, the G's not there. Right, right. That's exactly what I'm thinking is I, I have like a little, um, I would probably just program in like a MIDI thing that plays chords and then it would just find the notes that are available and play those notes if they're available in the chord. Because that's, that's my goal basically is to be able to play a melody over chords over the saxophone that I was playing, like sampling my saxophone real time to play chords of saxophone behind it. So it, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Maybe maybe it'll sound really weird, but I kind of want to try it because I really just love the sound of saxophone. It's just a, uh, it's one of my favorite sounds. There's um, let me pull up this thing here. This not well somewhat related to what you're talking about, but like it's like a different take on that. This is uh, derivation saxophone. I forgot his name. Um, yeah. Uh, he had a web page for, but he's taken it down. Um, so he, he's doing a lot of stuff with a uh, Ben Carey. He's doing a lot of stuff with uh, modular synth these days. But he had these series of pieces called Derivations. So he's a sax player, and um, he's got like a whole setup that he's built in Max that does like all like short form, long form audio analysis for different audio descriptors and this and that and the other. And it would uh, build a kind of a library of thing that would play back with him. Yeah. Um, in, a, in a really interesting way. I haven't looked to see if this has been done, so I'm not that surprised. No, no, no. Well, I mean, that's not necessary. Like, I mean, I guess that's a very sciencey thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like finding yeah. the literature or whatever. Um, but like, it, it might be an interesting point of inspiration. And he's done versions yeah. with all sorts of other performers where um, it'll be with like, a flute player and then um you you play with the system and it does a bunch of analysis stuff and and, and saves things and then it becomes like a, a, a version of this derivations thing yeah that's great that's great very inspiring rodrigo totally incredibly inspiring this was like surpassed all expectations and i i thought when i saw your website this guy is absolutely amazing you blew me away man. it's really awesome, nice to man. talk to you yeah yeah i've, I've really enjoyed it as well and it like as I said, like it, I've liked some of the stuff that I've, I've heard of what you've done. And I think uh, this is not why I do these things, but I, I do find these very satisfying as well. Like, is it's, it's always like having a conversation with somebody can always be very interesting and inspiring and, and engaging. And I find um, through like the weird self-selection that happens of the people that get in touch, I tend to have these conversations and they're equally inspiring and, and fun and enjoyable. And like uh, you, you get your brain into places that you wouldn't have otherwise. That's good. Awesome. I, I hope you were able to get something. I definitely have some very practical and things that I'm going to concrete things that I'm going to try based on this conversation. <laughs> we'll look forward to that. And and again, thanks for wanting to take part in this kind of uh, version of it. I think I have a name for it now. Like we came up with a name earlier. So I'll, actually, I'll run it by you. Uh, so the name is I have to pull it up here because I, I, I don't remember the order. So, so it is. This, I... Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Good, good. So it's it's gonna be, fuck. What is it? Particle castle bubble party. Particle castle bubble party. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs>
So I think this is the first Particle Castle bubble party. Hey Zach, this is Angie. I've been editing the video of you and Rod for like the past couple days, and uh, I hope you don't mind, but I have just a few thoughts on some of the things you guys talked about. And since I can wedge in um, some ideas here, I'm, I think I'm going to do just that, maybe just like as a little Easter egg for those that made it to the end. I've been thinking about, uh, it seems like you really like the idea of, of what if, of asking what if, and I want to challenge that a little bit. Because you mentioned it a couple times um, in the video. So the anecdote is um, someone's lost their keys and they're searching for them under the street light. And uh, someone else comes by and asks, oh, did you lose your keys around here? And the guy that is looking says, no, but this is just where the light is. You know, I think that's what's happening with the what ifing. Um, it, it it's like a ling linguistic trick. Um, so as you very quickly became aware, or uh, I saw you become aware of the limitations of what if. Um, so you're like, oh yeah, what if, but when? When do you do it? And then what do you do? Well, those are the key questions, aren't they? The fact that in retrospect, someone talking about things they've done says, oh, and then I asked myself, what if I did this? That's probably not what happened um, and it is kind of just a wrapper to communicate to someone a story about the events that did happen. Another thing I want to challenge is the idea of a constant capture. Um, I'm reminded of a scene from uh, a scene from that movie Glen Gary Glen Ross when um, Alec Baldwin gives that whole soliloquy and the, you know about always be closing like it's a it's a very cool and aggressive thing to say, always be closing. Um, but that's also kind of like, there's like a macho-ness to it. Um, so the idea of constant capture, you also have to consider that people are self-reporting the, um, what a lot is. So yeah, I, I make guard a lot, I draw a lot. Well, what is a lot? Is a lot an hour a day? You know, or it, it will vary from person to person. So constant capture, this idea of constant, does that just mean like like uh, it's always on your mind? And, you know, so it, the fact that it's self-reported um, probably isn't like, uh, you know, too reliable a thing. Um, more, more likely, and this is something that Rod touched upon, was the idea that you're involved in areas and things in like um, material already, like things you're interested in. And some of those can be art related, some of them not, and then they're gonna converge. Some things converge, other things don't converge. One of the things you could do is be more aware of the things that you engage in. So um, you wanna do something that's creative for you or something novel for you engage in activities you wouldn't do normally. Now, if you're just talking about like creative in general, well, you can do things that are very familiar to you and just new for somebody else. Also, I think, you know, I, I don't want to fall into the pitfall of defining what creativity is. Um, I don't know if, uh, I don't know what your definition is. At some point you did say that all you wanted to do was make music you like listening to. If that's the case, you're in luck because you already like to listen to music, some music. All you have to do is reverse engineer those sounds. And there's something to be said for this kind of work. Um, there's this guy called Kenneth Goldsmith that um, he's an artist where originality doesn't factor in, in he says, isn't like a big contributor and contributing factor in the things he makes. So the idea of uh, genius or originality in creation is just, aren't necessarily what's interesting. I would say that if you want to come up with novel ideas, things that are very idiosyncratic out of a bed of consistent um, and predictable things of predictable context, I would say the way to do that would be um, to set up 
or how, how quickly you can receive feedback about something you've made or an idea you've had in order to judge it, to decide whether or not it's good or bad. And then moving on to some other step, if you could speed up that process, um, that would that would aid in this novelty generation. Anyway, those are just a few thoughts. Oh, one more one more thought. I um, listening. It it sounded like you were a bit at odds with yourself in terms of uh, instrument fabrication. You said the per the most perfect instrument would be one you play with your mind. But then at the same time, you said you like to include the process of a thing being made in a work of art itself. For instance, you'd like to see where the paint has been and where it's going. And those two things are at odds because where the paint has been and where it's going is a physical thing that has happened with you interacting with the phys physical world. An idea came about not just out of your mind and not just through the interaction with the physical world, but perhaps even the physical world itself generated that thought for you. You got to see it and be a part of it and experience it. Alfred North Whitehead uh, also had something to say about um, things that you could uh, apprehend and not apprehend, as well as things that are being um, transmitted, which he called prehensions. Anyway, it gets in rather mathy and a little philosophical. So I think there's something to be said for um, um, maybe learning about a philosophy of embodiment. Anyway, those are my thoughts. I hope you liked this video. I really enjoyed editing it, and I know Rod enjoyed speaking to you.